Hello, Sebastian and Fabricio. Uh, but in this case, specifically Sebastian, because the other day we were talking and I was telling you that I think I want to do my research about onions. And you asked me what onions were and I started explaining, but you said that perhaps you needed a more in-depth explanation. And as soon as you said that, I thought, okay, that's it. That's what the next video is going to be about. Okay, so here it is. Uh, so basically, pretty much everything in nature can be classified into two groups bosons and fermions. And they have these names because of Satyendra Bose and Enrico Fermi. They didn't discover these particles, but they discovered that they could be classified in these ways. And so what makes them different is the spins they can have. Uh, bosons have a spin that is equal to an integer number times Planck's constant, and fermions have a spin that is equal to an integer over two times Planck's constant. And well, Satyendra Bose and Enrico Fermi discovered a bunch of things about bosons and fermions, but what we care about today is this. This is gonna show us the difference between uh, bosons and fermions. So uh, just uh, let me explain uh, like the, the, the symbols here. This is how we represent a quantum state in quantum mechanics. Uh, this is called a ket, and it's like a parallel line, a symbol, and then like at these angle brackets, and so, for example, this is a ket of psi. And so, for example, uh, here I'm, I have a ket and I'm saying, okay, so this is something that has a maximum spin of two, uh, but right now it has a spin of one, okay? Uh, so this could be, for example, uh, a molecule. Oh, because let me, let me uh, I forgot to mention that we can combine bosons and fermions, for example, into, into atoms and molecules, and their, their spins add up. So, for example, even though uh, uh, fermions have an, uh, a spin of one half, if I have, for example, four fermions together, together they have a spin of two, right? Because four over two is equal to two. Or, for, or maybe if I have six fermions together, they are gonna have a spin of three. And so even though individually they are fermions, together they can behave like bosons. And so this is uh, something really important. Um, and so for example here, going back to my example, Okay, so here I have some kind of boson that has a maximum spin of two, but right now it has a spin of one. And I'm saying, hey, this is actually made of two other bosons. Each of these bosons has a maximum spin of one, and right now this one has a spin of one, and right now this, ha this one has a spin of zero. And what, I what I'm gonna do with this boson is that I'm gonna perform a measurement. And, uh, or well, I'm, I'm gonna modify this quantum system, and I'm gonna increase the spin. So this is how we represent like, uh, measurements or operations in quantum mechanics, we put some kind of letter uh, to the left of the ket. And so this is gonna increase the spin and it's gonna transform uh, this, this boson uh, from having one spin to having its maximum spin, which is equal to two. And so that means that, but remember that this, this boson is actually made of these two others. So if I'm increasing the spin, well, I cannot increase the spin of this one because this one is already at its maximum. The only thing I can do is I can increase the spin of this other one because this one is not at its maximum. And I get something like this, right? Where both of these bosons have its maximum spin and so together they behave like this. Okay, fine. Uh, but now let's, let's look at some other system. This system has a maximum spin of one, uh, but right now it is at zero. And so this is technically a boson, but it is made of two fermions, each of which has a spin of one half. But right now, this one has a maximum spin it could, it could have of one half, and this one has its minimum spin of minus one half. So if I perform that same operation of increasing the spin of the system, I, I'm sure, like I can write this. I can say that, oh yeah, sure, now this is a boson with a maximum spin of one, and right now it has a spin of one. But how, how does that look for the fermions? And well, turns out that what happens is that, okay, like before, I cannot increase this one because this one already has the maximum spin it could have, so I have to increase this other one. And, but instead of just like being in the case of like the, the, these bosons, where I just like increase it and that's it, what happens uh, with fermions is that you, you can increase it, but you also get this minus one sign. And, and right now, this minus one is coming uh, out of nowhere, uh, but that's because like I'm simplifying things. If you go into the full formalism, you can see where this minus sign comes from. Uh, but uh, that would be like a, a, a very long detour. Uh, and I'm, I'm also kind of rusty on that formalism. So I couldn't even uh, show you the proof if I wanted. But just for now, trust me that this happens and it can be uh, argued mathematically 
very convincingly. But like, check this out. So we have like this system, which is like, okay, maximum spin of one half, right now has a spin of minus one half, and then I'm subtracting the same thing. And so what do you think I'm gonna get as a result? Well, zero. But how does that make any sense? Like, does it mean that when I, cr th when I apply this operation on this system, like what, it, stop it stops existing? Like, no, obviously not. Remember that this is quantum mechanics. So we are dealing with probabilities. This zero isn't telling me that the system is gonna stop existing if I do this. It is telling me that the probabilities of observing this, of observing these two things, is zero. I'm never gonna see these two particles in the same state. You see? Because they, they are this, this fermion has a state, this other fermion has the same state, and the probability of observing this is zero. And so, for example, this is why in chemistry, you never have like elect two electrons with the same spin in the same orbital. The probability of that happening is zero. And, and okay, so that, that's the difference between fermions and bosons. Bosons have no problem being in the same state as another boson, but fermions very much do. Uh, but, okay, but check this out. This minus one, minus one is just equal, and you know this, Sebastian, very well. Minus one is equal to e to the pi times i. Like, this is Euler's identity. It's very famous, you know it very well. Uh, Fabrizio, I imagine that you have also seen it. Um, even if you haven't used it as much, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure both of you are familiar with this. And so, now we can look at something. We can say, hey, so if I have some quantum system, and if I apply, uh, do some kind of operation on it, well, in some cases, not always, but in many cases, this is gonna be equal to that same system I have times some, uh, this, we call this a phase, a, uh, a complex phase, that is determined by this number alpha. So for example, we can say that bosons, they have an alpha of zero, right? Because if I have like i times pi times zero, it's just equal to zero, i to the zero, e to the zero is just one, and so this, that's what we have here. Like, in each case, it was just multiplied by a one. Uh, but fermions have an alpha of one, so that's why this ends up being uh, equal to minus one, right? But there are also anions, and anions can have an alpha equal to any number. Not just any real number, it can be any, it can, it can be any complex number. It can be real, it can be imaginary, it can be anything. And, okay, so now the question is like, wait, wait, wait. But like, you showed me that there are bosons and fermions, so where are the anions? What's an example of an anion? And the thing is, anions don't exist in nature normally, but we can create them. We can take electrons and force them to work together to, to behave as anions. But to do this is very difficult, because we need to fulfill a certain set of conditions. Uh, for example, we need to uh, limit the electrons to move only in two dimensions. Because as soon as they can move in three dimensions, they behave again like fermions, and they don't, they don't behave as anions anymore. Uh, we also need them to be at very low temperatures, we need to have very strong magnetic fields, and there are reasons for all of this. Like, it's, this is not, maybe this sounds like a magic ritual. Like, oh, you need to uh, have very low temperatures uh, uh, under the moonlight uh, during the equinox. But no, uh, uh, we, we know exactly why we need to fulfill all of those conditions is just, it, it would take me a long time to explain. Maybe I, I'll explain that in some other video. And actually, this reminds me, for example, of Nenvaus, Nen, Nenvaus in Hunter x Hunter. So in, in that show, the, the, the way the magic system works is that you can make a kind of contract with the universe that if you fulfill a certain set of conditions, you are going to get some power. And the way the magic works is that the universe keeps its end of the deal. As long as you keep the conditions, you are going to have that power. And so that's kind of what's happening here. Like, the nature tells us that, oh, as long as you fulfill the conditions, you are going to have anions. And so we fulfill the Nen vow and we can get anions. Uh, but why would we want to do that? It seems like too much work only to, to what? To, to change this probability from zero to something else? That's what would happen, right? Instead of this being a probability of zero, now it's a probability of something else. What's the point? Doesn't seem like we accomplish much. Well, the reason is quantum computing. Uh, you know that in quantum computing, uh, we work with qubits, that instead of being just zero and one, we have a certain probability of zero and a certain probability of one. And those probabilities are given by, in this case, alpha one and alpha two. They are also complex phases. And so the way quantum algorithms work 
is that, for example, you take uh, your original phase and then you perform this quantum algorithm, and then uh, the the end result is that well, you are going to modify this probability to something which you can see as just like you added some kind of number to to alpha one, and then you added some kind of number to alpha two, and so this is, would be some kind of quantum yeah. algorithm. And so in the end, when we perform a quantum algorithm, we are not looking for zeros and ones. We we don't care. Uh, what, for example, maybe if zero and one was the spin of a particle, we don't care about the spin of the particle by the end of the quantum algorithm. We care about the probability, right? And so in fact, when we perform some kind of quantum algorithm, we need to actually perform it many times so that we can measure the result many times and from there, they use the probability of the results and from the probability we can get the, the, the faces and from there we can see uh, what happened? Because quantum information is encoded in the faces of the of the wave functions, and now maybe you can see why anions are so useful, because anions can have any phase. So if if we are encoding quantum information in the phase, <laughs> actually it sounds kind of uh, like I'm coding it in your face. It sounds kind of like. Uh, some kind of vague threat. I'm going to encode quantum information in your face. Anyway, the point is that if we're encoding quantum information in this complex number, the fact that this complex number can be anything for anions makes it much easier. Mind you, that, like, it's not like it's impossible otherwise. We can encode a lot of informa quantum information using bosons and fermions, but the way I see it, quantum computing right now uh, using bosons and fermions is like using vacuum tubes for computers back in the day. Like, yeah, sure, you can do it, it works, but it's much lower, it's much more difficult. And so anions would be like the transistors of quantum computers. Because even though they don't do anything that we can, they do the same things that we can do right now, they just make it so much easier. So that's why we want them. And so, for, ex for example, the way that would work is that, uh, well, we need to, okay, so... Performing quantum uh, uh, algorithms is just performing certain measurements. And when you think about it, when you move something around, you are kind of measuring its position, right? So for example, if we have two anions and we sort of move them around, well, at some point we're gonna lose track of which is which because in quantum mechanics, everything is uncertain. And in the end, we perform some kind of measurement. And by moving these particles around, we measure their position, and so that changed their phase, and so we encoded some quantum information related to our algorithm, and so quantum algorithms with anions can be performed by just moving them around. And so uh, these diagrams are called braids, and so you can uh, encode any quantum algorithm in these braids of anions. So for example, I have like here, uh, maybe this is, this is a braid that only involves two anions. This would be an example of a braid that involves three anions. This is an example of a braid that involves four anions. Uh, and, and you can have any number of anions uh, moving around in different ways. And, by, and in that movement, you are performing extremely complex quantum algorithms in a way that is relatively simple. And I, I don't know, it sounds so cool. Like uh, the idea of like working on these new quantum transistors made of anions. And so yeah, basically that's it. Uh, obviously there's a lot of, I didn't explain about like, there's a lot more to say about quantum algorithms and the, 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 the conditions that we need to ensure that anions exist. And well, uh, we, we know how to create some anions in real life, but we still don't know how to create any kind of anion. We only know how to create some kinds of anions, and that's a whole story for another time. But yeah, hopefully, this, uh, Sebastian, this gave you a much better understanding of why anions are so cool and why I'm considering that maybe uh, I want to do some kind of research on this.